have to discuss the book of a philosopher. Well, the reason we have to do so is because Marcus Sandel is a very prominent and famous, let's say, philosopher. So he has been or he has been teaching in Harvard, and also he is what we could call a public intellectual. So he is teaching philosophy and the political philosophy and morality, and he was running a series called Justice, which even made it to let's say the the popular. It, it made it to TV. So it's the equivalent of Milton Friedman's Free to Choose, an intellectual who has, let's say, a direct channel and an appeal to the people. So his latest book is, as I said, The Tyranny of Merit. And being a student in the Objectivist Academic Center, uh, I had actually to read the book because we went through it. And actual Michael Sandel had a discussion with some objectivist intellectuals a couple of weeks ago, which was very interesting to follow, although it was for a closed audience, so it, there, you cannot find a publication of it. But what is the main point he makes in the book? The main point he makes in the book is that he's trying to explain some political developments that have been happening lately, such as, for example, the rise of populism. And he says you need to understand that populism has to be we need to see the roots. And the roots, he says, is that there's a lot of people who feel that something very unjust is happening. So Sandel is coming from the point of view of the center left, let's say. He's not a radical. He's not of the AOC or the Bernie Sanders side. He said, no, 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 I'm a moderate. But what I want to understand is why so many people go to the extremes on the right and on the left. And this is because, here's the injustice, a lot of people are on the elites, or what we would understand as the elites, the 1%, let's say, without deserving to be there. And many people are down on the social hierarchy without, also without deserving to be there. But there's something even worse, he says. We believe in this false god of meritocracy, which tells you that whatever happens in life is your responsibility. So if you do well, you feel this pride, and you should not feel this pride. If you do not do well, you feel this, you feel this bitterness, and again, it's not your fault. So you should not, or it's 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 not a matter of merit. So the fact that you are not doing well doesn't say anything about who you are, your character, or your morality. This is the general, let's say, approach of the book. So, Dr. Locke, what's wrong with Sandel's, and why do you think it's a book that we should be discussing? Well, I consider the book at root uh, extremely evil, and it's against the whole concept of confidence, merit, earning a living, uh, life and happiness. Uh, his, basically, it's a three-pronged attack. Number one, you don't deserve economic credit because actually you didn't do anything. You might have come from wealthy parents. Uh, you got into college by cheating. Uh, you're lucky to live in the U.S. because you could have lived in the Brazilian jungle and you didn't. Uh, uh, you got, you made money because you were just lucky that you were selling things that in this point of time, people actually wanted to buy. So lucky for you, they did. And uh, everyone can't move up to the bottom from the bottom just in one generation. So in other words, and so you get no credit for anything, it was just luck and determinism. Uh, second, you get no moral credit over and above the financial credit. Uh, why? Uh, making money does not reflect your virtue and what would real virtue consist of? It would be working for the public good, which I'm gonna get to later because he doesn't make clear actually what he means, but I think I know. And then he talks about it's merit is cruel because the wealthy live to mock and humiliate the less successful. And therefore, the people who are less successful, uh, dependent on them for approval and who are considered losers, have no self esteem and no self respect. So, uh, so those are the basic. Uh, attacks he makes, all of which are totally wrong. 
and I can go into uh, so let's take them, any let's of take those them. when you ask what you can ask me which ones to go into what's wrong with them yeah so let's take them one by one let's say let's take so first of all let's make something clear that at least from people who know him Sandel is someone who is intellectually generous so he has read his Hayek he has read his Nozick so he is aware of all the criticism of the other side. And yet, when he says, for example, that it quote from the book, it invites the winners, so he's talking about capitalism, it invites the winners to consider their success, their own doing, and the losers to feel that those on top look down with disdain. Now, this looks a bit like a caricature from a Soviet film that it's this rich businessman with a cigar and he's pointing the finger laughingly at the poor. So I know some people who do that, which interestingly, you're more, it's, there's a bigger possibility to find these people who look down at the masses in let's say the middle classes of the academia rather than on the very poor. So why does Sandel believe that, is he projecting? So why does he say that, oh, if you're, if you're not doing well, you're seen with disdain. I can understand if he says you should be doing better because it's an unfair system. But where does this idea that, oh, if you're not doing well, uh, you are being ridiculed and you're being, uh, you're being uh, let's say, uh, marginalized? Well, all of his attacks are based on a hidden agenda, which is anti-capitalist and, uh, you know, left-wing. Uh, he's, not, he's not for socialism, but for rather... Uh, public or the public good, which he never defines clearly, but if you read closely, what he seems to mean is you're only good if you serve the public good. And the public good is what's best for society, and what's best for society is undefined by him. But if you read closely, it seems to be uh, basically your only goal in life is to serve others. So it's altruism. Uh, as your as your major virtue, so anything else besides that is considered uh, worthless. So it's a collectivist view, uh, and he says it's not fair that factory workers aren't respected to the same degree as millionaires. But you know, if you're rational about this, and Ayn Rand would say, anyone who earns an honest living from the factory worker to the billionaire, they earn the money honestly, it's worthy of respect and is doing a moral activity. It's a moral achievement in the realm of economics because you earned what you achieve in money by voluntary trade. That would be Ayn Rand's view. Uh, his view is, uh, well, it's not your fault because you, you, know, you didn't take credit for it. You don't have free will anyway. So you were luck you lucked out. And even if you make money, you're not making it for the right thing. The right thing that's, would be how you contribute to society. Ayn Rand had a very good example here in her book on cap in her chapter on capitalism. Uh, Einstein versus lipstick makers. This was a great example. All right, now should a lipstick maker feel pride in making money? And her answer is absolutely yes, because people value, women value lipstick to make themselves feel better and feel more self-confident. And lipstick makers earn the credit and earn the money morally because they traded with people for something they wanted. So this is actually virtuous. Now, how about Einstein? How can you justify Einstein having less income than the lipstick makers. And Ayn Rand's uh, answer was that in a free society, Einstein doesn't go without reward, but no one can dictate properly if people have rights, what they should make money at and how much they should make and what they should do. So people who make lipstick are giving people what they want. They have a perfect right to do it. And uh, it's not an insult to Einstein. It's not a destruction of Einstein. It's a trade voluntarily between the taxpayers and uh, the buyers. She calls this the socially objective value of a product. 
that's what the taxpayer, uh, the buyers want. So it's socially objective because it's a trade. Now, she did talk about the philosophically objective. She said you could say certain things <coughs> would be valued more by the best minds. Such some people would think Einstein is more important than lipstick, but they don't have a right to dictate to other people what they can do. That's and, that, and would actually Sandel, statism, that would be statism. Sandel finds a very unexpected ally on his argument, which is Hayek. So whenever Sandel wants to, to present the pro-capitalism side, he doesn't present Ayn Rand. He, Ayn Rand doesn't appear in the book, but he presents Hayek. And, and he says, even Hayek would admit that you, the money you make is not the same as your moral value. And Sandel would bring from the back door the mafia, for example. So he would say, look, they make money, but there's not moral worth there. So here's though what would be, what would be the, the, the argument that at least the way I see it, in a free society, I have the right to pursue values that are more meaningful than, let's say, for me, lipstick or for someone else. So they would say, oh, look, the, 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 the video with the most views on YouTube is a stupid song. Therefore, capitalism is immoral. So what would be the alternative? Yeah. Would it be a committee of uh, wise people who say who should have more views on YouTube? It's like these villains in Atlas Rag who say when a book reaches a particular uh, selling point, then, then we should put it aside and give the right to other books. So it is the fact that you have the right to pursue the values that you want that makes it possible for Einstein, as you said, to also, to also make, make money. And also, wouldn't we expect that any other alternative would be how, what would be, so in his view, what would be the alternative? That, that's what I haven't understood throughout his book. So he's attacking capitalism, but the question is, in the name of what? Because he doesn't okay. seem to be sub suggesting that there's this other system that can be better. He, so he says he, he doesn't want left-wing populists, so he doesn't want socialism. So the question is, what is the system that, what is he after, basically? Because, again, okay. I don't think he's a two -hit. I don't okay. think he wants to just destroy. He looks like an intellectually curious, interesting person. So what is he after? Okay. So let's first dismiss discussing Hayek. Hayek's a collectivist and a subjectivist. It's not worth getting into an argument about Hayek. He picks Hayek because he's easy to attack because everything's random and you just got lucked out. So secondly, we got to dismiss the mafia. They were criminals. They make money by force and threats and murders. So they're not part of the capitalist system, they're criminals. So let's get to what Sandel would say uh, is good. Now, as you say, he's vague about this and it's something to do with uh, your contribution to the collective good. Now, since he's not for dictatorship, you have to assume the only thing left for him would have to be public opinion, which would be pure democracy. So the but public, what about the public opinion of the, the public, market? That no, 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 I'm talking about public opinion of the law. Yeah, but he says that he doesn't like the public opinion when it makes the lipstick maker rich yeah. and Einstein no, not so rich. Because he's so, not. They're not doing the right things. And, and the question is, how, what would be the right things and how would they be determined? Now, he's vague on this, but by implication, he has to support implicitly the greatest good for the greatest number. In other words, pure democracy. Because there's no other way to do it if you're not a fascist and a communist. There's no other way to do it. Now, he doesn't say this because he doesn't want to get caught. But it would have to be mob rule. Now, remember, the greatest good for the greatest number, as the collective subjectivism, last alternative, if you don't have rights, uh, could involve the majority enslaving the minority, or killing them, or robbing them, or enslaving them. So if you're going to have a so-called democratic system, you'd have to have limits. And of course, the United States is not a democracy. It's a republic, which guarantees individual rights Protect, protect you from the mob. So when he gets into the application of his ideas, he's extremely wishy-washy. But he has to, by default, uh, have some kind of mob rule in which the mob 
and through Congress decides how much each person should make. So and he also and he believes in a guaranteed life too. So one of the things they would do is guarantee everyone's life through mob rule. So that has to be where this ends in a pure democracy and equivalent. So we discussed a bit the political implications, but you're a psychologist and, or you have experience with psychology. And what I'm very interested in is what are the psychological implications of such a view on people's self-esteem and on people's life? So listen to this quote from, uh, from Sandel's book. So he, he talks about people who, students who are proud because they made it, let's say, to a top university. Quote, while it is true that their admission reflects dedication and hard work, it cannot really be said that it is solely their own doing. What about the parents and teachers who help them on their way? What about talents and gifts not wholly of their making? What about the good fortune to live in a society that cultivates and rewards the talents they happen to have? End of quote. So here what we have is we have the famous Obama quote, you didn't build that. The way I read this is you didn't build this and you can never build that. Basically, you can never build anything. Whatever you're ever going to build, and there's a lot of John Rawls obviously there, but whatever you, whatever you, you build there, you, there's always someone else and it's not you. So what does the effect of such a worldview and such a view of life in a person's self-esteem and in the way they address and view the world? Well, it's, it gets to absurdity because, uh, to be fair, you'd have to you'd have to create America, you'd have to create the whole society, you'd have to create the courts, and you'd have to create, uh, and you don't have free will because free will is uh, intellectual intellectual ability is partly genetic, but what about effort? He says, well, effort doesn't count either because that's conditioned also, so he tries to wipe out uh, choice and free will. But then he goes farther and says, even if you achieve something, it's not morally worthy because you're not acting in the name of the greatest good for the greatest number or what he calls the, uh, 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 the mer merit uh, for society. So what, even if you get around all those problems, uh, you still don't get any credit. Now it's very important, and Ayn Rand made this very clear, the merit the pride you get in making money does not reflect your entire psychology and your entire philosophy of life, and your entire character. What you get paid for is honest trade. Not about your how you treat your wife or how you treat your friends or whether you cheat at poker. Uh, it's about honest trade. And therefore, if you did honest trade, by your own effort and, and free will as in my book says is axiomatic you have free will you know not omnipotence but free will to make choices you deserve moral credit and you deserve pride now of course he also mentions the religionists can't defend capitalism either because if they succeed they say oh, oh thank god uh, god did it which is terrible betrayal but i think the reason the religionists use god to uh forgive making money is because for them pride is the worst of all possible sins so they can't take credit personally egoistically for what they did and it wasn't, wasn't me wasn't me it's god but that's out of unearned guilt that's due to unearned guilt because if they accepted credit like I did a good job. Yeah, I worked hard. I did a good job. Then it's the sin of pride. So the religions can't defend it either. Uh, so between the left and the right, it's coming down on honest making a living for everybody. So that's very important because we can see that people coming from completely different political points of view, let's say, they reach the same philosophical conclusion. So that's why it's very important. And many students of objectivists and objectivists say, it's not about politics. You don't start with politics. Because you can see here, for example, Hayek, someone from the center left, 
a religious person, all coming down to, yes, you didn't build this, or no, you know, you, you, the money you make has nothing to do with your, with your, there's nothing moral per se in productive activity. And at the end of the day, they're telling you, you are not capable of being happy. Because then what is the recipe for happiness? Well, if it's unless, not, you, unless you serve the masses. Unless you serve the masses. But in order to flourish in life, you need to make sense of the world and you need to create stuff of the world. You need to produce and you need to you need to understand the world. So if you follow that recipe, you will not be happy. And yesterday we mentioned on the Giving Tuesday episode, we mentioned uh, some characters from Ayn Rand's literature. We mentioned uh, Kate from the Fountainhead who takes this seriously that my mission in life is to serve others and how this completely crashes her how to he destroying her self-esteem and telling her no 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 it's not about your life it's about serving others how at the end of the day we have something which is a shade of your previous self and a shadow and something which is there's almost completely soulless anymore well interesting here also imagine yourself as a doctor okay you're a doctor of medicine your goal is to diagnose, treat people, and make them better. Okay. Now, you should go into that for only one reason, or one fundamental. You love the concept of being a doctor. You find biology, disease fascinating. You love the challenge of diagnosing and curing people. You love the satisfaction of seeing people get better. And you certainly love the appreciation uh, that you get, and you certainly earn a good living. But the whole way it's framed is you can't, you can't frame it that way. You've got to frame it only one way. I only live to serve my patients. So I can't talk about the fact that I love doing it. Because in reality, every person who trades is serving others because it's mutual egoism. It's mutual egoism. My services for your money both get what we want. Both can be happy and proud of the outcome. So you're not allowed to say, I'm doing it because I love it too. No, no, no. I'm only in service. And the conservatives do this. So you're a millionaire, but you don't, the only reason you can be proud is because you serve the public. Well, how about doing stuff you loved and getting just rewards. Conservatives are no better than liberals in defending capitalism. It, this is super ironic because in the Bible, it says love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> so where are they going with that anyway? How do they smuggle that in? And the, the way they smuggle it in is because it's it's actually altruistic. And making, money is all, making money altruistic, you got to pretend you're not getting anything out of it. Now, which puts them on the side philosophically of the liberals. So only they're going to disagree about the amount the government takes, but not about the principle. And this is why the conservatives have been so abysmally bad in a defending capital or stopping the intellectual assault by the left. Because I'm very curious, what would be, for example, a Ben Sapiro's point of defense towards, for example, Sandel. There would be something about, no, you know what, the mark is going to make us all better off. But at the center of the argument, it would be very awkward to see someone who is religious and what I know would call by an altruist, which, again, is different from someone who is a benevolent. And it would be difficult without a different morality to, to, to attack this. And also, by the way, let me say, I don't ever want to fall in the hands of a doctor who would tell me, I'm here only for your sake, and there's nothing in me for it. And that's a total sacrifice that I'm going to try to save you. Anyway, we've run out of time. So many thanks to Dr. Locke. Just a reminder, Dr. Locke has written the books, The Illusion of Determinism, Why Free Will is Real and, ca and Casual. And also, as I mentioned in the beginning, The Selfish Path to Romance, which is a book I've been really enjoying, co-authored with, with Ellen Kenner. So, Dr. Locke, thank you so much for being with us. And But for our audience, the action for tonight is not over because in half an hour, we have Yaron Brook, who you probably most of you already know, so no introduction needed, and 
Toby Young discussing the issue of social media and quote censorship. So we've been told that when social media is deplatforming someone or they are shadow banning or they put warnings on Trump's tweets, we've been told that this is censorship and that's an attack on our free speech. Is this the case? So in 30 minutes, join uh, ARC UK's YouTube channel. It's going to be live streamed there. Some of you have probably all also registered, so you will be in the Zoom call. But from me and Dr. Locke, once more, thank you so much for your, for your contribution. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.